Yes, we're recording. Hello, welcome back to the third Gitly training session. I'm uh, Jacob, I'm a staff backend engineer on the Gitly team. And um, I'm showing, uh, I'm just going around looking at how Gitly uh, integrates with the rest of GitLab and showing you stuff. So last time we were looking at Git push and SSH and how that uh, first hits GitLab shell, and then uh, from there, it re-authenticates with GitLab, and then it establishes a Gitly connection, and then more stuff happens. And I wanna get to that more stuff because there's some surprising things going on uh, during the final stages of a Git push. Um, maybe I should start with a high level. So what, what happens during a Git push? Um, let's see. So. What happens is a client uh, runs git push and then a uh, client git establish, um, uh, somehow starts up remote git receive back uh, command on the server. Um, client git uh, sends, uh, negotiates references go she hates refs client git sends back file data um, and uh, client git sends ref update and then uh, the server unpacks back file data um, I think the server does some checks on um, no I think those checks actually happen later so the unpacking itself is a kind of check uh, server updates refs. And the interesting thing is this, because uh, this implies hooks. Uh, this has hooks, uh, which GitLab relies on, crucially. And those hooks are, uh, the hooks we use are pre-receive. Uh, we sort of use update, but not really. And post uh, receive. And somewhere here in the middle, um, Git does the actual ref updates and that was the server side Git, so that's Git receive back. And uh, the reason this is interesting is that these things uh, make API calls back into GitLab. Um, this one is maybe easier to understand, or this one is less. This one is less mind-boggling because this triggers CI. Uh, it creates like notifications in GitLab that the actual push happened. So you see in the uh, UI that your push happened because the post receive hook ran. Um, because we we have to tell the Rails application sometime because when uh, this receive back process is started on the server, that is not the time to send notifications into the system saying, hey, user X pushed something, because at that point, you haven't even received the data, you don't know what they pushed. Um, so this is mostly about notifications. Uh, another thing that it does is that uh, you have this feature where if you push a new branch, then GitLab gives you a URL where you can click to make a new merge request so that you are, all that stuff is printed by the post receive hook. Um, okay, so but that's the uh, that's the easy one. This is the tricky one, the pre-receive hook, because what Git does uh, before it runs these hooks is that the data that it receives, the the pack file data, it puts that in quarantine. It gets written in an alternate object directory that is a temporary directory, so uh, nobody knows about it unless you know the actual path to that directory. And you can only run git commands that look up, uh, that look at that data if you know that uh, quarantine directory. And specifically that means, um, it gets really interesting because this pre-receive hook implements features like protected branches. How do we block a push to a protected branch? Well, the pre-receive hook gets input from git that says the user is updating branch X from Y to commit Z. And uh, GitLab can then look at that and say, hey, branch X is a protected branch and this user does not have the permissions to push to this branch, so we block the push. This thing can abort the whole push. 
Um, but for GitLab to look at those, um, uh, look at what's happening and to apply these validations, it needs to look at the Git repository. So this is actually, this thing runs on the Gitly server and makes a, uh, calls back into GitLab with an API, HTTP API call. And then GitLab makes RPC calls back into the Gitly server to look at that, at that Git data that is about to, to be committed and to uh, decide if it looks right. And this is fairly complex because that Git data is in quarantine. So you need to be careful that all the uh, RPC calls that run during on the GitLab side during the pre-receive hook know where the quarantine data lives. So Jakob, um, when it's creating this quarantine area, this is like a random path and temp or something. Is is that worth what it's doing? Yeah, it creates a temp there uh, somewhere underneath the uh, repository. Uh, I, I think what I want to do today is, uh, among other things, show show you what happens and where this thing is, so you can see that it gets created and when. Um, okay, cool. Uh, and I'm, I I I figure this time let's try and sort of sketch out a plan of what I want to show instead of <laughs> just rambling around randomly. Um, but yeah, it's a temp there. Um, so this, yeah, this is super tricky. What's happening here? The, or basically this state, uh, this state of the push transaction is very tricky because you're using quarantine data. Um, and this will also be very interesting. However, we solve it in our HA implementation because um, if you replay a push to several Gitly servers, each of them will create their own random quarantine directory for the objects. And uh, those any lookups you do that need those quarantine objects are super specific to the right Gitly server. It's not a problem today because there can be only one Gitly server the repo is on. But for HA, that's an issue. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's, uh, that's roughly what I want to look at. Um, and I double check before I start this call so I don't say something stupid, but we don't have distributed tracing yet in GitLab shell. So the, uh, sorry, in the hooks. Um, so the API calls that get made here are invisible in uh, the tracing. Oh, we're building out the tracing anyway. It's not a, a still a work in progress. So I can show you this with tracing. Also, I don't know how to use the tracing, but otherwise <laughs> I would have learned it now. Um, so I'm going to do this the uh, uh, some low tech way. I know that, uh, yeah, so I want to show the API calls. That's where I want to start. So first I have a repository here and I'm going to make uh, a new branch. Um, I have no idea what this is about. I think this is because it's a test repository with bad data in there. Oh, that's because I actually ruined that. Um, well, let's fix that first. Uh, let's get rid of the get attributes file. And I now want to set something up where I can easily repeat uh, pushing a commit. Um, so let's see. Uh, and I want it to be a new commit. So if I do something like override the readme, uh, there is a readme, yes. And I uh, make my commit message hello, and I do a git push. Then I expect this will get pushed to my GitLab. I am running GDK, so this is pushing to local um, via SSH to my local uh, GitLab server. And yes, that works. So. Uh, let's make that a function so it's a little easier to repeat. So now I can just say P and it will push. Good. Now I want to show what that does. Uh, so let's tail some logs. I know that, um, so I want to look now, now look at, I, um, I want to look at the access logs of the Rails application because I already know that that's where the API calls are being made. I'm going to truncate the log because this is development and is this full of stuff I don't care about. So first I need to go to the GitLab directory, log slash development. Let's see how big that is. That is big. One. Yeah, that is uh, 13 megabytes of stuff I don't care about. So let's truncate that. And now uh, let's still this file. 
and push again and see what happens. Okay, a lot of stuff happens, maybe too much. Um, okay, I know from experience that Rails has these lines that have started in them, so I'm just going to restrict myself to these started lines. So let's edit that till command and grab that. Again. Okay, so, well, there we have it. Uh, what is happening here is that, I'm not sure where there are two calls here, but this is part of the GitLab shell part where we interact with the SSH daemon and the pre-authentication. So this is the setup that allows GitLab shell to establish a Gitly connection for this particular push. And then during the push, we make this API call and this API call from the hooks. Um, so, okay. Um, now, uh, what do I want to show you first? Uh, maybe let's look at, um, yeah, let's look at what, uh, uh, well, let's first look up this repository that I'm pushing to and see where that is. Uh, that would be on my localhost 3000. I want to find the directory it's in. And I think I just converted this machine to hash storage. So uh, that means I need to check in that in panel. Um, no, it's not in this list, or the list is too deep, I guess. I think it's this one, GitLab org slash GitLab test. Hmm. Okay, so it hasn't been migrated. So I expect this to be in, um, uh, let's create a new window for that. So this is my GTK root. And uh, I know that the repositories are in a subdirectory called repositories. And if I now go to this relative path, that should exist. Yes. And I can do a find dot. Uh, that's a bit too much stuff. Find objects. Let's make this a little easier. Getting rid of the loose objects. And I only want to see files. So these are the objects that exist now uh, at, in, in normal states in this repository. I just shrunk them, right? They all just ended up in this back file. Uh, I don't, I guess these are not referenced and that's why they are still loose doesn't matter. But I was saying that during the push, there is a bunch, uh, there's these extra objects in quarantine and we want to see that. Uh, now the nice thing of about how the hooks work is that they're Ruby and you can, uh, they're one-off executable, so I can just edit them and uh, wave, <laughs> wave to the camera. Um, I know that in this setup, they are in the GitLab shell repo, which is a weird artifact of history. So here's the pre-receive hook. Let's see if I can wave. And now I'm going to push again. Yes, there we are. I can wave. It says hello there. Um, so uh, let's now see what the uh, objects look like. And I know that the hook runs in this directory, so I can just put this find command here. Um, let's see, I have to be smart because I don't want to send it to standard output. I'm not sure if that is okay. So I think this would redirect that. Let's see. Yes, that worked the first time around. So cool. Oh, P doesn't do any, or that's something different. Um, fine. 
rerun the find. So here you see that all the objects are either in these directories which start with two hexadecimal characters, which is Git's fan out scheme to make sure that you don't end up exhausting the num maximum number of directory entries, or they're in the packs. But here we have some loose objects and pack files and this incoming stuff. So that is the quarantine area I was talking about. Um, I don't want to slurp. Thanks. Um, so uh, how do we, uh, how does this work? How, how do we even know where to look for these things? Because and we're not supposed to run find and say, well, I found some random extra directories here and let's assume that these objects belong to the repository. So what's actually happening is that Git is telling us uh, about, or Git is telling, yeah, Git is telling us in the hook about these objects. And we can see that if, um, okay, I should have checked this before we recorded. I hope there's nothing embarrassing in my environment, but if there is, we'll find out. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do system and, and grab things that start with Git. And I'm going to do that to standard error. Push again. Hmm. Do I see anything? Uh, no, this does not look embarrassing. Good. <laughs> so this is information that uh, Git is passing to this sub-process. Uh, the good thing, the nice thing is that uh, in this sub-process, the Git will automatically use the quarantine directory. And that is because of, um, well, I guess it's because of these things. Let's look what we have here. So there's a quarantine path. Then it's repeated as the git object directory. And then there's a, an alternate uh, object directory defined, which is actually the normal object directory. If you look closely, you see that this part is the path to the, where the repository is on disk. Uh, and then it goes to slash objects. So git commands that run if, if I were to run a git command in this hook, it would run in a sort of topsy-turvy world where the main object directory is the quarantine directory. And then there are these extra things which are actually the normal objects. So this is how the quarantine mechanism works. Are you still with me? So if we're trying to quarantine it, um, why would we point to the real object directory? What, what kind of stuff is going to go in there in this pre-receive? Um, the problem is that these uh, environment variables will completely break Git. Um, let me see if I can sh demonstrate that. Uh, if I do git show ref uh, head in this temporary repository, that just works. But if I say uh, git object directory equals var empty, and I then do git show ref head, then it is throwing up all over the place because I just pointed its object directory to something that doesn't exist. Oh, so it's because this is a partial um, set of objects and yes. it's gonna to refer to objects, okay. Yeah, the quarantine area is partial because that is the, those are the objects that were just pushed and usually a push is incremental. Um, but so if you look this at this, this, uh, yeah, like you said, this points to a partial, just of oh, only the new objects. And this is not a complete Git repository. It's not a valid Git repository. For that, we also need to remember where the rest of the repo is. And that's why Git sets these two variables. I wasn't actually aware that Git set this one. I'm not sure what it's for, but it is sort of backing up my story that it's actually called quarantine path. <laughs> um, yeah, and it and you can see it just repeats this. So um, maybe I I can tell you another time where we can look up another time why that's called why that one is there. Uh, we only rely on these two, so we do something pretty uh, complex because so these two things are important, and uh, we only know about them in the context of this hook. 
So when this hook makes an API call to GitLab, it actually looks in the environment and sends these values. Um, now let's see if I can uh, show you that that is actually true. Um, so that would be API internal. And the thing we're going into is the pre-receive. Okay, I should just search. This one. Uh, that's odd, shouldn't there be something more happening here? I don't know how this code works. Oh, okay, now I remember. So, I was looking at these API calls and saying, well, I guess these two are the setup of the session and then these two happen. Wouldn't that make sense? Actually, that's not how it works. Uh, this one is session setup. Uh, this one is pre-receive. This one is also pre-receive. And this one is post-receive. Why the hell? Well, it makes no sense. Um, and this is actually, uh, this, is, this is technical debt. That's the short answer. Um, what happened here is that uh, GitLab shell, so this part, the session uh, set apart for SSH, this code lives in the GitLab shell repo. For legacy reasons I don't want to go into, all the code that does this also lives in the GitLab shell repo and it shares uh, implementation codes, even though they are part of completely different things, right? Because the session setup is part of this, starting the git receive back process. And this stuff is part of the hooks, which is all the way down here. Why is this in the same repo and why is this called GitLab shell? There is no answer to the why, but it's how things are. Um, and this leads to all sorts of, I'm breathing wrong uh, into the microphone. This leads to all sorts of confusion because uh, in particular, we are reusing this endpoint either to establish a Gitly connection uh, after uh, receiving an SSH session, or we're using the same endpoint when we're in the middle of a hook, of a Git hook that runs on the Gitly server. Are you following, uh, are, are you still with me? Are you following this? <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, yeah. So logically, these are two separate things, right? This should be calling a different API endpoint, like really it should be calling this. But actually for legacy reasons, it's calling the same endpoint and that's because a whole bunch of code that is in GitLab shell was just calling the same API endpoint. And that API either returns data you need to establish uh, at this, for the session setup, or it does something completely different. Just, just uh, let's, let's see if I can find the code and uh, see if it's true, back that up. That would be the allowed, Oh boy. Yes, here we are. Let's assume that in a, make that bigger. So this is the implementation of the allowed uh, post. So this one. Um, so first of all, the actor can either be identified by an SSH key. Guess what? That's when we're up here. Or it can be identified by something that points to a user ID. Guess what? That is this case. Um, because these hooks, of course, also run during an HTTP push, which has zero to do with SSH, but the code is mixed because legacy. Um, so then we go into this access checker and there's some real fun here because um, where are the changes? I want to see the changes. There's a, a parameter here called changes. Um, 
access checker, actor project protocol, namespace. Here we go, params changes. So what the hell is params changes? Uh, let's see. This is my very ugly uh, debugging hack. Um, let's see if it works. I, this should show up here now, if code reloading works, which I never know if it will. There we go. So I was just telling you that uh, there's these two calls and uh, <laughs> luckily I was right. <laughs> uh, so in this first one, there is a changes param on this HTTP post, which is as a bogus value underscore any. And that is because it is just as GitLab shell trying to establish an SSH session and it has no idea what the changes are because the data hasn't been sent down the line yet. Um, and we still hit the same API endpoint because, because no, but we do. And then the second time around, we're actually in the pre-receive hook. And uh, here we have concrete information about a change. These are commit IDs. And it's saying that this branch, test branch is, or wants to be updated from this to this. Okay. Um, so I found the part of the API that uh, does the um, that does the pre-receive. This is the real pre-receive check. I'm not sure if it helps that I keep saying it makes no sense, though I think it's true. But is it making some sense now, or do you at least see what is happening? Yeah, I see that handler does a lot. For that, uh, yeah, for that API it, it, it has two different purposes, and for the pre receive, we only care about the second time we hit it. Uh, and one way to recognize that is that the changes field is populated and has real data in there. Um, okay, how did I get here? I wanted to show you the quarantine directory, so let's see where that is. That is here. Um, this thing is storing the quarantine directory. So let's see what uh, we have here. Um, I'm just going to do the same dirty logging trick. Um, come on. So what is this env thing? So when I do a new push, it's going to be slow because it is doing a live code reload, which is still better than me having to restart the whole thing. These are errors from SSHD because this is sort of a non-standard way to uh, set up SSHD. Okay, this is exactly what I wanted to see. Uh, let's break that up a little bit. And we know that here, so this first one, This is the session setup one, right? And uh, this whole env thing is empty because duh, it's only relevant for the other use of the dual use endpoint. This thing is empty. And oh, I put the white space in the wrong spot. I need to put it here. Now this is uh, the actual git pre receive hook API call. Now, here we have this fun information. So we have alternate object directories. Um, then we have, okay, actually we have them in duplicate. And we have the changes. So let's look at this a little bit and compare this with the environment because we're still printing the environment up here. Um, what do we have? We have this, this, and this. So two of these, uh, well, first of all, you can see there are absolute paths 
and uh, and relative paths. The um, why do we have both? Well, uh, during the migration project, we were in a weird transition state where uh, some of the code would run run uh, the, the hooks and later code that looks at the uh, the Git repo might run on different machines where the repos are on different mount points. So absolute paths would break. We actually had this break on us. So uh, we had to, so because Git gives you absolute paths, right? You see here, this is, uh, come on. This is an absolute path, but uh, that is not the same thing to pass around the network between servers. So we convert them to relative paths, to relative to the repo directory. So this one is dot git slash objects. So the relative path is object. So we can forget about this one. And uh, here you have the same thing. It is dot git slash object slash incoming something something. So we can forget about that. So these two things um, are known are only valid in the context of this API call. So they are local to the uh, that one HTTP request. And what we do with them is that we store them here in this class. Oh, sorry, also the alternate one, not only the quarantine, but also the, the, the alternate. Yeah, yeah. Well, strictly speaking, the value in alternates is always the same, but uh, we don't make an assumption about that. We actually later on, we throw these two things together because we don't really care which one is which. We just make sure, we want to make sure we have everything because we're not doing any writes. Okay, okay. Um, so, <laughs> okay, and you're starting to see now maybe why I was saying this stuff is very subtle and good to know about if you want to know what happens during a git push. Because the other thing, uh, maybe I can show by scrolling back here. I mean, this is one random string. Of course, during my last push, it was a different random string. Right, it's a temp directory. It's different every time. Um, so because we need to use this, and because all Gitly calls that happen in this Rails process uh, during that um, during that API call need to respect or need to know about this extra secret quarantine directory, uh, we stick that information in this hook env thing. So let's look for hook env and see what's going on in there. So this is where that is defined. And that is using a uh, request store. A request store is uh, a wrapper around thread local storage. So regardless of whether we use a multi-threaded or a single threaded Rails application server, this will be local to the request. And the other thing that's important or good to know about uh, this stuff is that there's a middleware in the Rails stack that resets this request store after each request. So it's it's thread local and because of the middleware, it is local to the uh, to the request. I think, Fran, you've seen this before. Uh, Paul, I'm not sure if you've seen this before. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I, that is in the, the rack middleware and also clears and sets the, the, the request store on each, on each uh, request. Yeah. You with us too, Paul? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, you basically have to reset it and isolate it so that it's not reused for other requests. Yeah, if this were Go, I guess we would be using context and uh, and variables you would set on a context, except it's not Go, so we are we have some roughly equivalent Ruby thing. Okay, so these things get stored here and uh, at the start of this uh, handler for the um, this API call, and then later they get used. Uh, I'm going to ignore this rugged thing because that's legacy uh, here in Gitly clients. Because when we create a uh, Gitly repository object, we need uh, to send these objects over to Gitly. And I mentioned, I, I think I hinted at this uh, last time uh, that in, uh, how do I keep track of all these windows? Um, Gitly Proto. We, 
we have the repository message and here you have these fields that are about uh, exactly this. So that's where they come from. And this is the one magical unicorn place where we need them and that they're critical because otherwise you have an incomplete um, repo. Okay, um, 38 minutes, and I got to, got to this part. Uh, that's good. <laughs> um, do you have more questions about this stuff? Not at the moment. Okay, cool. Uh, then let's see where we can take this next. Uh, because this is the most, um, this is, I think, the, the weirdest, trickiest part of the, well, I, okay, I can show a little bit or talk a little bit more about what happens on the other side. So here we make these things, relative paths, those relative into the Gitterly proto repository message. And then, of course, on the Gitterly side, we take those relative paths and we join them with the absolute path to the repo because that's where we know the absolute path and then we hand absolute paths back to git just to be safe i think git actually can handle relative paths but we we're not counting on that um and yeah let me show the gitly part because it is it is still one way or another it's a weird thing uh we don't need to look at this we don't need to look at this so in gitly we have um Okay, that's too much. Um, where is this stuff? There we go. In Gitterly, we have a thing that both resolves the repository path from a repo message. So the repo message was here. Uh, so the repository path is resolved by looking up the storage name in Gitterly's config and memory, mapping that to an absolute path on disk, and then just joining this path to it, right? And then you have the repo path. Um, and then we also look at these fields, and these fields then, um, I guess we just put them in a, a list of uh, a list of strings that are as a representation of environment variables. So this thing then gets called in specific places to make sure that we set this extra environment variables on any Git processes we spawn. And also if you go down to the Gitly Ruby layer, you'll see that when we create a rugged instance, we also feed this into rugged and say to rugged, hey, here's a repo and use this extra directory because otherwise you can't find all your objects. Uh, let's see for a moment where this thing gets used. So I guess we're smart about using it in cat file. Uh, we, oh, this looks like we just put it on every git command, which is a relief because <laughs> then we can't forget to do it. Um, yeah, so we do it here. And then for some reason, I'm not sure about, we do it um, manually here, maybe because, no, I have no idea why. These do it manual. Yeah, so that's where this thing trickles through. So we had the the push, and we saw that during the push, Git sets these variables for us, and then we interpret that during the hook. We send it along on an API call. We store it in thread local storage on the rail server, and then all outbound RPC calls from the rail server pass this value back into Gitterly to the same Gitterly server where this directory actually exists. <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe it's not as mind boggling as I think it is, but I always struggle to explain this. Um, cool. So uh, let me turn off Slack because I have no idea what people are gonna say to me. Um, what else can we look at here with git push? Um, I think this sort of this sort of tells the story. 
Um, we could take a look at how git push over HTTP works. That is one thing that's interesting. We could also look at web commits, um, but I think web, well, git push over HTTP is more similar to uh, git push over SSH. So maybe we can just squeeze that in now. Jacob, uh, one question. Uh, the, the, uh, once the request gets to the, oh, well, first, the changes get to Gitaly, right? Yes. The, the changes param, and then Gitaly forward those changes to RAG. Uh, now back to Rails, right? Gitaly, for go on. No, 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 go on, please. So, so the, the, the changes, maybe I should show where the changes come from. That's a good one. Um, that is here. So I could say uh, warn refs and that will then end up in the outputs. Where, okay, I should say something more. I'm using warn because that is a Ruby, um, it's like PUDES, but it, what it does is uh, stand, um, sorry, standard, standard error dot PUDES, PUDES, which, so it's like saying puts and just puts in random strings, except they go to standard error uh, because I am not entirely sure. Let's see what happens if we put to standard out. Does get like that? Yeah, okay, I guess we can, here we can also push the standard out. Doesn't matter. Um, where do the refs start? The refs start here. And because we're pushing just one change, it's just one line. So this is, uh, and this is part of the interface of the hook because Git doesn't know whatever this hook is. The hook is just an executable. Git uh, finds this executable in, um, where is it? Uh, here, core hooks path. So it finds it in this directory and it sees, oh, there's a hook, it's executable. I'm going to run it. I'm going to feed this stuff on standard out, sorry, on standard in. If the hook exits with zero, then the push is allowed. If the hook exits with one, the push gets denied. Okay, maybe I should demonstrate that for a moment. Uh, sorry, um, abort, no luck. Sorry, go away, so go away. We do that. Then remote says go away and Git kindly tells us that the pre-receive hook declines. So that's the interface that we have there. So what is it you wanted to know about the changes? So about the about this stuff. Fran. Sorry, I missed the, 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 the mouse for a moment. Uh, so once we make the request, uh, the push um, and get to Gitaly, we forward back the changes to Rails, I think, to call the Git yes. access uh, class. Yeah, this, that's, this post contains the changes in its body. Okay, okay. And um, I closed the file again, but I can find it. Uh, allowed, uh, no, uh, post dot dot allowed. No, one more dot. There we go, grab magic. Um, this was the handler. And the, so the changes get, uh, I think it's a JSON post body and um, some middleware unpacks that into a hash, the params hash. And then here we have params changes. And that gets fed into the, the access check class. Okay, okay. And um, there is where we interact with our rules and our, and our yes. rules. Yeah, exactly. So all the, all, all the all the hooks and rules are gathered underneath that class, 
and I guess Fran, you're also familiar, more familiar with this class because you worked on the hooks in the wikis. Um, yeah, so this thing fans out into a, a whole lot of checks, and if you're very unlucky, it fans out into expensive checks that slow down your push. But that's a different story. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, so that was the changes part. So, uh, yeah, we have 10 minutes left, so we can take a look at Workhorse. Have we tried that? Okay, actually, I already spoiled, uh, that said something you don't know yet. Um, okay, so what is Workhorse? I mentioned Workhorse before. Uh, it is um, a reverse proxy that sits in front of the Rails app. Uh, one way to explain it, if you don't know the concept is imagine uh, we took Nginx and we stuffed it full of plugins, except it's not Nginx, but it's a custom Go app and we wrote all the plugins in Go. Um, I don't know if that, if that helps, but it's, uh, it, it is, uh, it's a reverse proxy uh, with lots of custom features and it's a, a weird architecture thing that happens because uh, in the, we used to just have Rails uh, and uh, these Ruby processes have their limitations. And this was a way for us to hack in um, things that hack things into the request cycle that we'd rather not do in Rails. And over time, it got bigger and bigger. And anything that is slow, like a, an upload, is better done in Workhorse because there, uh, that is a Go process. It's just a Go routine. So having a, a Go routine that takes five minutes is no problem. Having a Rails process, a Rails request that takes five minutes often is a problem, particularly with Unicorn, which is single threaded. So then you're hogging a process with several hundred megabytes of memory for five minutes. So that would never be a good idea. Uh, so that's what Workhorse is. And actually the original uh, use case for Workhorse was to do Git over HTTP because Git over HTTP can take however long it needs to take the, if you have a very big repo and you try to clone it, it's gonna take a long time just because you need to copy a lot of data. Um, and before we had Workhorse, we had unicorn workers with a one minute timeout. So if you wanted to clone a large repo, you would hit the one minute timeout and be out of luck. Uh, so Git HTTP was a completely inferior uh, transport compared with Git SSH. That was the, the status quo a long time ago. And um, Workhorse, the first thing that Workhorse solved was uh, I was trying to get uh, get HTTP uh, to behave better and offload that from the unicorn process to this thing, this workhorse process. So what does that look like? Um, I haven't, oops, I haven't rehearsed how to approach this. Um, let's see. So the, in workhorse, we have some roots with the pre-receive uh, or the pack uh, endpoint. Maybe? Yeah, let, let, let me first maybe try and explain what the transport looks like, uh, just irrespective of GitLab. So in the SSH case, you uh, establish one session and then you have bi-directional traffic across that uh, session because that's, that, that, that's how SSH works. You can have bi-directional communication and um, you get your data and then the session is done. Uh, HTTP doesn't work like that, at least HTTP 1.1 and 1.0 doesn't work like that. Uh, you have a, a fixed request response cycle and after your, uh, so you have to, you can only say one, you can say one thing if you're the client and then you have to wait, you get one response and then your request is done. So uh, the Git maintainers came up with a way to uh, shoehorn the, the process used uh, for the Git transport into HTTP requests. And the first, the, the major version, the only thing that is the most common version is called the smart Git HTTP protocol. That's because there used to be a dumb protocol, um, but we don't care about the, we don't support the dumb protocol, so we don't have to talk about that. The smart protocol, um, it emu emulates this stuff that ha happens during an SSH push only within a uh, request res response cycle. And the way that works, um, let's uh, take clone as an example because from the Git point of view, Git push and Git, from this transport point of view, push and pull don't behave that different. Um, so the user um, 
runs uh, git clone. Uh, git makes HTTP get, okay, what is it cloning, user cloning, user clones, uh, getlab.example.com slash my repo.git. Who would have a group named my? Well, doesn't matter. Um, so git makes an HTTP get request. Uh, Uh, slash info refs service equals git upload back. And that thing returns uh, a list of all the references on the git server. And um, uh, git on server returns list of all references. And what I mean by that is uh, it, looks, it looks a little bit like uh, uh, like, the, like this, it's formatted slightly different, but it's a list of IDs and uh, references. I guess we can actually run the, I'm not gonna do that. I could run the actual command that does this, but that's a distraction. Um, so that goes back to the client. Um, client um, looks at objects it already has. Well, no, sorry, the client first looks at this list and decides what it wants to have. Uh, git on client picks what uh, refs commits it wants to have. And then uh, git client makes HTTP requests posts. Uh, git upload back. And um, Post body uh, uh, description of the wants and the halves, because the client may already have, actually for a clone there are no halves. So well, it's a description of what it wants. Um, yes, that's it in the post body. And then um, the post response is a back file with the requested objects uh, and uh, a ref update description. Just, I think this is repeated in the response. I'm actually not entirely sure. Um, maybe we can look at this next time if we want to. You can, um, if you use a mitten proxy or something like that, you can actually intercept this stuff and look at what goes on on the wire, uh, but we don't have to. So uh, that's the cycle. So instead of one SSH session, you have a get uh, followed by a post. And a fun fact is that uh, in production, you see that you get way more gets of these get requests and the post requests. So apparently, at least on github.com, a lot of people, a lot of clients are just checking to see if there are changes. Because if you do um, git fetch and git fetch comes back and says nothing changed, you're already up to date. That means that um, it did that get request. It got the list of everything that it ha that's there and it decides there's nothing new I wanna have. Um, yeah. So that is, the, uh, that is the mechanics of the transport. This is, and this is the main difference with git SSH because uh, the, the basic idea is still the same. So what we have in Workhorse is uh, we have HTTP routes that intercept these specific requests and do something special with them. You still with me? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually it's now uh, three minutes uh, till the end of our window. Um, so I'm not sure how, I should probably, I can show it in the code. I guess uh, we can do that. Unless you have a question about this, because happy to answer. No, no, I mean, it's, it's clear. Uh, my main concern right now, but I suppose it is done in, 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 in Workhorse is the authentication in this case, when you perform the Git clone. Yeah, this is, yeah, that's a, a, that is a not so clear piece of code. So that is worth looking into. Uh, I think what I'll do is actually, I'll take this description and fill in what, uh, what happens in the uh, GitLab case. So Git makes this HTTP request. Um, 
and that uh, request gets intercepted by workhorse. Uh, workhorse pre-authenticates the request with GitLab Rails. And this is similar to what uh, GitLab Shell does at the start of a session. Um, if okay, Rails responds with Gitly session data, Gitly address, uh, so network address, uh, access token, uh, uh, repo, um, Gitly proto repo object, etc., and then uh, GitLab workhorse. Uh, establishes Gitly session, um, copies, okay, let me just make a new line, workhorse, copies, uh, well, there's nothing, there's no request, um, uh, copies response, Gitly response into HTTP get response body. So, okay, I, so here Rails only interfere to uh, validate that pre-authentication. Yeah. The rest of the work is done by uh, yeah. workhorse in Italy. Yeah, because this, uh, this is a fast request. It's just a database lookup. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, it, it is, it's only telling workhorse enough so that workhorse can start proxying all the data back and forth to Italy. Um, and in the post case, there's a little more work, but really the only difference is that um, uh, workhorse copies post request body to Gitterly and it copies the, the Gitterly response back into the body. So it's it's really just proxying, copying data back and forth. Okay, great, thanks. So that's the high level overview. And if we want, we can look at this in more detail on what this looks like in the actual workhorse code and how, uh, and how this, what this part looks like. Yeah, that'd be, I think that'd be a great topic. Cool. Uh, well then let me end the recording.